send you the one from China. <laughs> one minute. I would take it, yes. I would take it. A problem in the government. All Our right. Uh, almost us. one minute. Now we're live on Facebook. Sorry? Hi. We're already live on, we're Facebook. Live on Facebook. Yeah. So we are ready to go. Oh, okay. okay, I'll start my screen share. No, 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 not yet. Later, later. No, not yet. I'll, I'll okay. introduce your first you thing, guys. Okay? Yeah, Mike, please. No, I don't want to introduce me. <laughs> no, just short, kidding, short, man. short. Okay, are we ready? No, long, long, long. Okay. <sighs> ready? Let's go. Okay. Good evening and welcome to episode six of Beyond Birding here on the Asian Bird Fair online talk. I'm Mike Liu in the Philippines with Victor Yu in Taiwan. Thank you for joining us here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Our guest tonight is Christina Cinco, Vice President of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. She has a very interesting story to tell how, how being a bird watcher led her to discover the significance of Manila Bay uh, in the East Asian Flyway. Good evening, Tingai. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that you will not fall asleep um, <laughs> watching or listening to my talk on my experiences, more on my experiences of Manila Bay because my mentor and uh, my boss is over here, Arne, <laughs> uh, who's uh, ready at hand to monitor what I'm saying. And okay. uh, that's Ooh. it. The floor Welcome, is yours, Tingai. Okay, so now what I do is to start screen sharing, right? Job. Yes, yes. Yes, Tingai. And then um, there it is. Okay, it's my video. And then um, play. Okay. Just a short annotation, can you hear me? Um, this is what happens in uh, Manila Bay during a uh, feeding time of the shorebirds or the waders. Um, think I can you speak in the microphone? It's difficult to hear you. Okay, Arne, I'm not yet speaking. I'm just introducing that these are the uh, shorebirds that we usually see in Manila Bay. Okay. Uh, is my audio all right? Um, I actually uh, got this from Adrian Constantino, and he was the one who videoed um, uh, this, uh, this water birds, and most of them, I believe, are the ones that pass through the East Asian Australasian flyway. And most of them are, I guess, are, are the ones that are threatened already because of um, various developments in Asia. Think, think like how far are they from you? Sorry. One, I guess, was um, taken uh, with um, with a spotting scope uh, and it just used a, oh, maybe more than 100 meters away. Okay. okay. It is very good. 
at doing this. Um, if it's me, I don't think I can uh, take a shot this um, this well. Okay. So, um, so this is just a teaser to we really see when we are out in Manila Bay. Um, so may I begin my, my presentation already? Yes, please, yes. Okay. Um, so I do the slideshow. Okay. Okay, there. Great. Hey, it's it's moving. I don't know why it's moving. Okay, there. Great. Oh no, what's happening? Back. Uh, how do I go back? It's moving forward too fast. Okay. Um, job. I need your help. I need to go back. Okay, there. So that's me. So um, why do I call myself a reluctant birder? Well, this is my story of Manila Bay. Actually, Mike chose a very good day for my presentation. It's moving. I'm not yet there. I'm not on the second slide yet. Um, today is a significant day in Philippine history and uh, it's called the Araw ng Kagitingan or the Day of Valor. So we, it's a holiday in the Philippines. Uh, this is to commemorate all our heroes uh, of World War II when um, Bataan, if you have been to the bird festivals, um, Bataan uh, is where the Filipino and American soldiers fight by the... Why do I call myself a reluctant volunteer? Anybody who knows me is, you know, will be amazed or puzzled why I'm doing this surveys of Manila Bay. As, as Mike will, will tell you, I am a, technically a dude birder. What is a dude birder? I do my birding leisurely. And I'd like to enjoy everything, you know, my friends, the birds, the scenery. But Manila Bay changed me somehow. And my story began in 2006, uh, 2016 when uh, Christian Perez uh, asked me to arrange a trip um, care of my, my boss, Arne Jensen. Uh, since I have relatives and contacts in Navotas to do this survey. And the rest, as you can say, is already history. Next slide. Now, does someone move? Next slide. Okay, this is how I, tra this is how I traveled before. Well, I'm very close to my grandmother and every uh, opportunity she said, that traveling is education. So before, when I traveled, I traveled like in a bubble. I only traveled with my family, my extended family, my friends, and um, you know, people who know me. So just in case something happens, I know who to run to. And uh, usually, when we say travel in the family or with my friends, it's travel abroad. I hardly traveled within the Philippines. It was, you know, it's either we go to Hong Kong or nearby Singapore. And then um, eventually we went to Europe. And I enjoyed the company of my friends, of course, in my family. And uh, with this also, one of my hobbies is painting. So as you can see in the uh, picture below, I'm very close to the sisters. 
Um, these are retired nuns uh, from the school that I come from. And once a month, I usually do um, classes, no? uh, free of charge, of course. And I teach these nuns. And in 2006, this is where I met Peter Sutcliffe, who was my watercolor painting teacher. Uh, and his wife, Lenny, who is an avid birder, asked me if I wanted to join and go into bird watching. And from that time on, well, I got hooked you know, from, well, 2008, when she first brought me uh, birding in my hometown because she wanted the place where um, other birders can go. Now, Lenny Sutcliffe became very influential in my life uh, because from a city mouse, I am now turned into a nature lover. Next slide. Oh, it doesn't want, okay. So I met all these wonderful people from the bird club and with the new friends, uh, I was able to uh, join the various committees of the club. And since Lenny was, um, since Lenny was uh, head of the education committee then, I became a part of uh, uh, that committee. And since we, we were with the education committee, uh, we were always a part of the Philippine bird festivals. So because of the Philippine bird festivals, I was able to travel practically from Luzon to Mindanao. Um, as you can see here, wading through streams and rivers, going to islands with Mike and the rest, and crossing bridges in war-torn Sambuanga. Okay. Next slide. In 2014, uh, I became a member of the executive committee of the WBCP. And would you believe that my first um, my first assignment or my first experience of going to an international bird festival was the Asian Bird Fair in Langkawi. I believe it is the fifth. And from that time on, I never stopped till 2018. Um, I was also in um, the 15th uh, Chipotle. Invite uh, foreign delegations. The Philippines is one, Hong Kong, and um, India. Well, of course, um, as you can see, we were also part of, um, I was also part of the delegation to the Asian Bird Fair in Ulsan, South Korea. I should increase my attendance of the Asian Bird Fairs. I think I only went to three of them. But eventually, uh, I will. You know, it's one of my targets. And the last one was in Taipei in 2018 for the Taipei International Bird Fair. Next slide. OK, this, uh, this is me uh, in the bird club. Uh, this is what I basically do. I'm a member now. I'm the head of the education committee. And of course, uh, the records committee. Also, I'm not the head, Arne is here. He still presides over the records committee. And um, I think I should mention um, that as a member of the Bird Club, uh, it gave me such honor to be privileged to exhibit my watercolor paintings during the 25th International Biodiversity Day at the National Museum of Natural History. And of course, um, it also gave me a chance to, to perform before an international audience during the sixth um, Asian Bird Fair in Jingshan, China, when we danced the Tinikling and sang uh, Pang Yu in, um, in front of the delegates. Okay, the reluctant volunteer became the nature defender. So through these slides, uh, I will show you 
how I was converted from the dude birder who enjoys leisurely uh, birding to somebody, uh, as Mike describes me, a hardcore birder. I can't believe it myself. Okay, what is Manila Bay? Most of us, even uh, the Filipinos and foreigners alike, know Manila Bay only as that part of Manila, the capital city of the Philippines. Um, to your top right, we are most famous. Manila Bay is most famous for the sunset. And of course, Rojas Boulevard, where you usually pass um, coming from the airport. Now, uh, the one, the picture below shows you uh, the rehabilitated um, Manila Bay as what the government is trying to show by putting dolomite, uh, crushed dolomite to represent white sand. So these are some of the controversial things that's happening in Manila Bay. And as a background, Manila Bay in history um, is also uh, something very significant. A lot of battles were fought um, in Manila Bay, especially uh, in the southern part from which Manila City uh, is found. Now you have the, um, the invasion of the Chinese in 1574. You have the Dutch invasion in 1646. And then the Battle of Manila Bay between the Americans and the Spaniards when eventually um, the 300 colonization of Spain ended with the um, taking over of the Americans. And of course, uh, one of the last one is the Japan Japanese occupation of 1942. Now, why am I saying this? Because now it's a different battle. And I go through my presentation. Even the name Manila comes from a type of mangrove that is found along Manila Bay. I hope I get this right because there are a lot of biologists. First of all, I'm not a biologist, so uh, please bear with me. It's Ephora hydrophilacea. It is um, a type of mangrove, and in the local vernacular, uh, Filipino, it's nilad. So my nila technically means near the mangroves, the nilad mangroves. Okay, we go to the next slide. So this is what I have seen through my travels uh, as we traverse Manila Bay. I call this the scenic landscape. Um, in this picture, what you can see is Bataan from Manila Bay. And I, Arnie, correct me if I'm wrong. This was from Orani. And Arnie pointed out, and he's always teaching me how to read maps. And even in the map, you can see the mountains that clearly marks where we are then um, at Orani. In this picture, you have the mountain range of Bataan. And of course, the significant mountains of Mount Natib, Mount Samat, and Mount Marivelas. Those who joined the 10th Philippine Bird Festival will remember that we had our bird race at Mount Samat. And it is also in Mount Samat that um, the monument to the fall of Bataan, you know, for the, for the, uh, the, statue of, of our fallen soldiers are. Okay, so what time do we start our um, surveys, our expeditions? Well, we usually start before sunrise and very few people I think have seen or known the sunrise over Manila Bay. And this particular picture, you see the sunrise in Pamarawan of Santa Cruz in Bulacan. And on the bottom part, 
is the sunset view of um, from the east bank of the Pampanga River in Makabebe. Okay, Jobs, that's how my to move. Um, Jobs, it doesn't want to move. Okay, so still, uh oh. Um, to move backwards. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, the the previous picture is um are the scenes that uh oh uh oh it's moving um can I move it back? Oh no, it's moving. Sorry. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Pingay, you want me to control the screen? Yes, please. Just tell uh, me when to. Okay, please okay. move it back. Uh, three, I think, three slides. Can I just say next, next, next? Yes, but, yes. Okay, okay, back, 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 please. Okay, okay. Um, one slide forward. Thank you, Job. Okay, so these are the scenes. Um behind the scenes of um, Manila Bay. So you have the Kalagiman River in Samal Bataan. Actually, I wasn't able to capture, but um, I was really enchanted in this river. And if you see the boatman, he was carrying a boatload of scallops, which is very expensive in Manila. And I think he had two boatloads, boats load of scallops at the time. Now, um, these are the century-old mangrove forest in Tansa Peninsula between Navotas and Obando. And then on the bottom part uh, is a river scene near Santa Cruz in Paumbong. And of course, uh, the last part is the, um, this is like at the mouth of the river. Okay. Um, of the River between Pilar and Balanga Bataan. Next slide, please. Okay. Now I wanted to to caption this the unplay. As you can see, dredging is being done already. In so this is to pave the way for the uh, construction of a new highway that will co connect um, Orani, uh, I mean Bataan to Manila. And of course you have the mouth of the Imus River where there was so much garbage, but plenty of birds too. And of course, uh, Isla Pulo in Navotas um, where you can still see um, Last November, they've seen, I think, somewhere in this area, the Blackface Spoonbill. And there is uh, an annual visitor, which is the Chinese egret. Now, with a picture with Willem um, and Christian on the bottom right, um, you can see garbage. This was taken in 2014. Well, it is somehow cleaner. But at that time when we went, I took this picture. Um, there was so much garbage, and I think um, this are washed ashore um, from the nearby um, dump site, which is in East Lapulo. Um, Mike and I had a very scary experience then uh, in 20, I think, I believe in 2015, right, Mike? And with the garbage uh, washed ashore, most of them were medical waste. So there were like um, broken vials, used syringes, etc. So I think this place is though deserves so much garbage. Next slide, please. Uh, just to show you some of the water bird census sites in Bulacan that we go to. Well, of course you have the 
tall pans of malolos, which brought us so many surprises, like the Asian dowagers, which I was really dreaming of seeing in Olongo in Cebu, but now I've seen them. Well, it's pushed back a bit my plans to go there in, in Olongo. And of course, um, one of Arne's favorite spots, the mud flat, the one of the last remaining mud, original mud flats in Manila Bay found in Santa Cruz, uh, Paumbong Bulacan. And on the bottom left, um, this is um, one of the fish ponds that was uh, destroyed during a storm surge in 2011, Typhoon Pedring. So what uh, is the message here? Um, nature can reclaim back, you know, whatever uh, it owns. So this used to be enclosed fish ponds with dikes, but now they're gone. They've been ravaged by the typhoon. And now we're rewarded with beautiful birds. And on your uh, on the bottom right um, is where we usually take off at sunrise when you see thousands and thousands of uh, turns, whisker turns or river in turns um, in Obando, Bulacan. And this is where uh, the new airport is supposed to be constructed. This is one of the, the starting points of the airport's jobs. Next slide, please. Okay, this is what I look like when it's data gathering. Um, I'm not, well, I like riding boats better because I don't have to walk. I'm not really fond of hiking or walking. And these are one of my most comfortable positions while taking down notes. But of course, you have to balance. So this is how, um, how we gather notes. And you have to be fully glued to your notes because Arne says um, you have to repeat everything that's being counted. And sometimes I'm just wondering how many birds really Arne counted because he sometimes counts in Danish. So now I, I believe I can understand Danish. No, that's just a joke. But this is how we usually uh, do the counting. We even get off the boat and, um, you know, like steady uh, the scopes uh, in the water itself. And it's really eye straining to those who are counting. I'm just taking down notes. Next slide, please. Okay, this trips wouldn't have been successful without our boatmen. Like, if they have to drive because it's slow tide, they will. And of course, um, if we want to see a particular bird, they will by all means do everything for to our uh, target birds. And as you can see, they even assist in holding the scopes because of the, you know, the ripples of the waves. Um, it has to be steady so that uh, birds can be clearly seen. And another job that they do best is, of course, taking my picture at our pictures. Next slide, please. Okay, so I always look forward to um, our lunch and if this um, will mean I have to wake up at midnight to cook lunch, I mean, to prepare our food, I will. Because we have a saying in the club, an angry birder is a hungry birder. And I don't really want me and my teammates to get hungry. Unlike Arne can go on and on and on without, you know, eating something and um, go on with the... Uh, the survey uh, in the bottom left, this was the only shade that we can find in Pampanga along the Pampanga River Bank. And it was such a small tree, but still, you know, we, we, we park anywhere and sit. Now, this fish port in Paumbong has a story. This was our first um, survey in 2016. Um, we didn't really prepare much. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. So as usual, I don't go out without food. So 
um, we had to share our food because we were relying that we can find food, you know, in in places like the market. But it, as it happens, nothing was there, so food was shared. So as you can see, lunches is some are what we look forward to take a rest and enjoy our food. Okay, next slide, please. I call this my bloopers. Okay, the first one on your top left, two men had to literally drag me down um, this, this makeshift uh, port, I would say. And it was like three meters above the water. It was kind of high. And I had to go down and maintain my balance. And it was the first time my knees were shaking and Arne was already in the boat. And um, at that time, he was telling the boatman, if I, of course, the trip will not push through. So, um, see, um, I always find the lighter side, but actually, I was so scared um, of uh, riding from descending from this bamboo poles. But eventually, I was able to do it. I don't know, maybe they carried me down. But I was closing my eyes and I don't know how many times already I've sunk in the mud. And um, this one was in Orani. Uh, three men were needed to extract me out of the wet sand um, because I sank really low. And of course, the rest of the team had to move on because we have to catch the number of birds that there were there in uh, on site. And of course, the, the one in the bottom left is one of our historical shots, Ar Arne, I remember. Um, Mark Jason took this picture because we practically walked in the mud and was able to balance without falling, but we're all muddy. And I believe the picture of Irene on the bottom right was the first time we did our survey in the middle of the bay by the sandbar. So these are the things that I don't really expect, but I was able to hurdle. Okay, next slide, please, John. Okay, why am I talking about this? I always find the lighter side to everything that is serious. Um, what is the impact of Manila Bay to the future Aerotropolis? So, mean, so many people in my country um, are excited because we're going to have one of the largest airports. Um, I'm not so sure if it's only in Asia or in the whole world. Um, it's going to be from the one, the picture on the top left in Obando Bulacan to this place. Um, this was taken, I think, before 2018, which is in Taliptip, um, Barangay Taliptip, um, Bulacan, Bulacan. And, um, well, I just Googled the, the distance, you know, in terms of um, car distance, kilometers, and it's going to be like 10 kilometers long. So at the bottom right is the image of how the airport is going to look like, which is um, going to be supposed to be built within five years. Now, um, the map on the bottom left is from um, Arne's study. And this will indicate, this actually is the shape of the entire Manila Bay. And as you can see, these are where the water birds are uh, in the Bay Area. And what is the connection in this with the building of the airport? We'll find out a little sooner. Next slide, please. Okay. Our trips are usually um, sponsored trips by the International Union of um, of the conservation of nature based in the Netherlands with a collaboration of Wetlands Internationals with uh, volunteers, usually from the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. 
and uh, data validated by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, I believe that um, only the birders uh, can do um, these surveys because we can, I think we are sunproof and uh, we have the resistance to undergo um, whatever type of weather. And, and this uh, particular surveys does not only cover Manila Bay, but with extensions to Candaba Marsh also in Pampanga and Cavite. Uh, next slide, please. Arne, come in anytime uh, you feel like, you know, we're already in the survey of Manila Bay. Next slide, please, Chop. Okay. So just for a background. Um, I'm already there. Okay. Um, just for a background. Uh, currently, the unofficial, unpublished um, number of birds for 2021 in the Philippines is 714, right, Arne? Um, and we have 242 endemics. More than 100 are migratory, and 75% of these migratory birds are, what are shorebirds. What are birds? from mainland Asia and use the East Asian Australasian fly strategically um, located. And why are these uh, studies done? Because mud floods are declining in the area where most of the birds breed, especially in Northern Asia. So in the bird areas, 600 important bird areas in South, 500 worldwide. So <clears throat> these studies are needed to find out uh, the how they can strengthen the conservation uh, efforts uh, within the region and to put into inter international cooperation uh, conservation strategies. Next slide, please. Oh, good. Arna's not saying anything. Uh, anyway, uh, I just, you know, sometimes I have a fascination with words. So I looked it up, you know, the collective nouns for the birds that we see in, in Manila Bay. Um, on the top left is a picture of uh, taken by Maya, and these are um, Pacific golden plovers taken in the Talip Tip area, which where the airport is supposed to be. Now it's called the congregation of plovers. We know that, uh, but I was surprised to find out that a group, a seriously big group of egrets, is called a siege, very warlike. You know, it sounds like they're going into battle. And below is what we're really hoping for, a prayer of Godwitz. This was taken in January uh, 2021 when our group with Mark Jason, Vilia, uh, Jasmine Meren, um, Juves Jesus, and Bob Natural saw 2,500. Well, the argument is, that you know they were counting like 2500 or 3000 but you know now we have a prayer of egrets and that's what we're praying for that we can save the bay through them next slide please these are some of the more my uh, these are some of the um important uh internationally important are how do you say this migratory birds of international importance because most of them are already declining in numbers over the years. Um, the, the far eastern curlew taken by um, Irene D is usually seen in the same spot. Um, this one is, I think, in Santa Cruz, but uh, in the picture shown earlier in Obando, we usually see the same flock that stays there over the years. 
And on the top right, I took this picture. Um, this is a picture of a lone Chinese egret that we saw in one of the salt pans in Malolos, uh, Bulacan. As you can see, it even has a satellite camera, which Arne said is very expensive. So we can see how important these well, birds yes. are. Sorry, sorry. Okay, um, this is the picture of a Chinese egret with a satellite camera attached to its body. I'm not so sure if it has a leg band in it. And in the lower left is a lesser sand plover taken by Christian Perez, uh, which uh, was taken like in April, 2016, already ready to breed and go back to the Asian mainland, uh, is it, or in um, the Eurasian part of Russia. And then on the bottom right, it, it, was, uh, it was very significant for me because it is the first time that I saw Pacific golden plover in breeding plumage, ready to go back to its breeding, breeding grounds. And this picture was particularly taken by Mads Baharias also during our first exploratory, exploratory trip off Manila Bay. Next slide, please. Okay, Manila Bay, um, I think one of the most impressive numbers that we have in Manila Bay are the terns and gulls. So, um, of course, um, this, well, the three pictures were taken by me, um, during our trips. And of course, um, it's very impressive how you can see the Caspian terns in the middle of Bulacan, uh, uh, especially along the sandbars of um, Santa Cruz Paumbong. Really fantastic in numbers. They can uh, Avery and company um, have seen more than 25,000 in 2019, I think, because it was like 23,000 in 2018, the first time we saw them in the banks of the Pampanga River. And what is very impressive also is, is the picture of Jasmine Meren on the bottom right, because you can see like four kinds of turns and gulls, like you have whisker turns, Caspian turns, uh, black-headed gulls and greater crescenters all together. And if uh, my memory serves me right, this is in um, along uh, Bulacan in Malolos. Next slide, please. Okay, and we have our unusual visitors too. The first one was, uh, the first on your top left is the Dunlin. Um, this was taken in 2017, and it was actually uh, Mark Jason Villa who spotted this. Uh, the last Dunlin seen in the Philippines at that time was in the 1970s, 70s, uh, in the northernmost part, I mean, in the northern part of the Philippines in Cagayan. But it was such a surprise, you know, when you're hungry, you think of so many things. I was taking down notes and numbers being done by Mark when he said, Arne, please take a look at my scope. I saw a sandpiper with 30 breasts. And at 1.30 in the afternoon, and you haven't eaten lunch, I said, oh no, Mark Jason must be hallucinating. And yes, Arne did confirm that it was a Dunlin. Okay, and then on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left, is the black-faced spoonbill, which they saw in on November uh, 2020. This photo was taken by um, uh, Ravi, I can never pronounce his name, Ian Gar, um, in November. And surprise, surprise, it was in Navotos. But as you can see, um, Navot, um, the place also in the Votas is about to be reclaimed and probably uh, soon this 
this spoon wheel will have no place to go. On the right side is um, the picture of 24 black face spoon bill, spoon bills that um, our team, Jasmine, myself, JJ, and uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, uh, the other one is where we saw 24 black face spoon bill spoon bills in Talitip, Bulacan, Bulacan. This is very close to where the airport is going to be constructed. It made the news in 2020, um, but, you know, um, this was during the time that our volcano also erupted. Now, the Nordman's green shank is taken by Adri Constantino. And this they saw during their trip in February 25, only this year. And I think, um, I hope that next time when I go to Manila Bay, I will see this because I don't have this in my Philippine bird list. So these are some of the rare sightings that we have in the Bulacan area, the Navotas Bulacan area in Northern Manila Bay. Okay, next slide, please. So just for a background, I want to share with you the results of the 2021 water bird, Asian water bird census. Uh, the, the entire Manila Bay holds 117,400 water birds, 62 species, mostly migratory. And then the Bulacan province where of uh, barangays Taliptip and Bangbang has 50,500 water birds and 61 species, species mostly migratory, meaning 50% of the water, water birds that can be found in Manila Bay. 15 of these um, species are of international importance and including 16 species, which are very high in numbers and even higher number of water birds supposed to be managed or protected under. Okay, next slide, please. In 2021, in the Taliptip Bulacan Bulacan area where the airport, the aerotropolis is going to be built, there were a minimum of 8,748 individuals or 17% in the aerotropolis area. 19,808 individuals or 40,000 in the adjacent adjacent areas, meaning these are the areas of Malolos and Paumbong. But in 2020, there are 12,528 individuals or 25% of the entire um, airport area. Um, you can see the birds. So immediately there is already a drop um, the following year because mangroves were already um, were started to be chopped off and cleared in this area. Uh, the supposed reason was that there was an infestation, so they had already to start to remove mangroves um, from the Taliptip area. Next slide, please. As an overall resort, uh, result, um, there is a 20% decline in the number of water birds compared to the previous Asian water bird census compared it to in 2017. 18 of these species are of international important numbers or being threatened with extinction within the East Asian Australasian flyway. 11 of these migratory species have declining populations in Manila Bay. When we speak of Manila Bay, we don't only cover the Bulacan area in the northeast, but we also cover the areas of uh, Cavite, which is further down south. And populations are occurring 
uh, if you are familiar with the Las Piñas Paranaque Wetland Park, the Tansa Wetland in Cavite, and the Pasak River in Sasuan, Pampanga. Next slide, please. Okay, we have enough laws in the Philippines uh, to protect these uh, birds. Um, first of all, Northern Manila Bay has been declared an important bird area, one of the 27 sites um, declared by BirdLife International. Um, and as earlier mentioned, the Philippines is centrally located in the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And with these numbers, um, we also have the Ramsar Convention, which protects the um, this uh, water bird species and their habitats. And of course, the Philippines is also a signatory to the Convention of Migratory Species or the Bond Conventions. And for first and foremost, and the most important one is our own local law, the Wildlife Act of um, Republic Act 9147, um, which is a beautiful law in fact, because it helps us preserve what is uh, the flora and fauna treasures of our country, which is supposed to be preserved for the future generation. And in uh, when I was going through some of uh, my readings, um, I, I discovered that Manila Bay is protected by a Supreme Court mandamus of 2008, which requires 13 government agencies to rehabilitate Manila Bay. And this does not mean like the Dolomite sand uh, beach that we are now seeing uh, in Manila. Next slide, please. Um, when I, when I was, um, when I was introducing what I was going to talk to, um, talk about, I said I was a reluctant volunteer and I was a dude birder. But I believe that I have developed into somebody that went up already a notch higher. Um, this year, well, in fact, December 2020, um, several environmental groups have um, filed and um, civil society of Kalikasan to prevent uh, cause of the aerotropolis. Um, the pictures above, um, as you can see, is a comparison of Barangay Taliptip in Bulacan, Bulacan, taken in January 20, 2020, um, where we found the 24 black-faced punwheel, which is the picture below. This is just an extension of the old mangrove forest. And on your right, is already the destruction of the area where the Aerotropolis is going to be built. Now, um, I was advised that every time I show this picture to add uh, this statement, that these pictures were used for the filing. Well, the uh, Rite of Kalikasan filed um, in December 2020 was immediately junk. And this time um, a motion for reconsideration was filed and uh, the photos above uh, were my photographs used for a judicial affidavit. And as you can see below is the further destruction of the last remaining mud flats um, in um, Bataan. Um, the, um, I should read this to quote uh, what was in the previous report. The most biodiversity rich and intact tidal wetlands are located less than three kilometers from the airport. Now, considerable sediments will be uh, dumped also and taken from the coast north of Manila Bay. Now, our guess is going to be in the Pampanga River and this will be going to be dumped in this area. So as you can see, you're not destroying only one area, but several areas um, in the bay itself. 
This will deprive 30 species of water birds of um, their feeding grounds during the winter migration. And in less than 50 years, you have an 80% decline of this migratory bird population. Uh, we're, next slide, please. Despite the um, Wetlands International IUCN Netherlands Committee's technical report on habitats and water birds in Manila Bay was published, um, development in four of the 10 important key bird areas were given reclamation or land development permits. This is the uh, contrasting decisions in our government. Like in December 2019, the president has ordered all um, reclamations to be stopped. And yet these areas along Cavite um, and several important key bird areas were given um, permits to reclaim. Now, um, to, uh, to those who are more familiar with the um, Imus River mouth, this is where Covlandia is uh, located, which as we will, we all know, will be turned into another gambling city. And then <clears throat> you have uh, important sites like Bacoor Bay and the extensive mangrove mudflat areas in Metro Manila. The three remaining mudflat areas in Bulacan where the new Manila International uh, River, uh, sorry, Manila International Airport will be built in the river mouth of the Pampanga River. As we always hashtag, our um, our pictures taken to this surveys, we strongly uh, campaign that wetlands are not wastelands because some of our um, some of our uh, people believe that since they don't see anything in mud flats and in areas close to the bay and it's it's practically empty and uninhabited that are they are wastelands that most of the time garbage is dumped. So as you can see, we are campaigning that wetlands are not really wastelands. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I pay tribute to everybody who I've worked with year of the Manila Bay survey teams. Thank you very much for having supported of this endeavor, um, we withstand heat, we withstand hot weather. And I think we should go on um, if we want to save Manila Bay. Next slide, please. This is my last uh, slide. Next slide, please. Oh, I think go back. It's the last slide. Okay, this is my last slide. I always um, like uh, quoting Arne. He said that what is good for the birds is good for the people. And I believe so because birds are our number one uh, uh, indicators of the environment. And with the wreath of Kalikasan, there is one beautiful good environment and I believe so. Um, as seen in the previous slides, we have seen dikes collapse, not by man, but by nature itself. It has reclaimed what is hers. And I believe that these birds are worth saving. And probably if we people cannot campaign um, to stop all this uh, destruction of Manila Bay, maybe the birds can help us. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much all and mabuhay everybody. Thank you, end of slide, end of presentation.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. All right. Are there, Thank you, Christine. Are there comments or questions to Christina? Yes, Scott. Hi, Christina. Hi, Scott. Hi, Christina. Hi, Scott. Good to see you. Very yeah, lovely good to see presentation. You. Thank <laughs> you, Scott. And just quickly on the for the airport, I'm not that familiar with the airport project. Yes. So it will be built in like it reclaimed is, land on the bay. Well, that... it's if you're familiar with uh, the airport in uh, the Kansai, I think in Kansai, yes. in Japan, this is going to be something similar. It is oh. above water because they oh, believe okay. that they're going to believe something very grand above water you know it's going to be a major engineering i see significant airport but has, has, has the government well i guess two questions one is it looks like it's already going to be built i'm but but if, if they're going to build it have they agreed to create any new natural wetlands and habitats i don't think so in other locations yeah i would seem you could at least I do that maybe so. okay. okay well i don't believe so Okay. Um, but, um, well, this is nothing official, but next time when we have our Philippine bird festivals, probably five years from now, when the airport is built, um, maybe I will suggest to Mike not to have it between uh, the months of September to maybe April, because that is where the highest concentrations of migratory birds are you know, where the airport is going to be built. And safety is one of our concerns if we hold um, this kinds of event. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I, I, I also have a similar question like Scott, because, you know, yes. uh, I don't think this is a way to stop it because I guess it's, it's, it's determined. So, yeah. um, so I would suggest, you know, there must be a, 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 a compensate site like the uh, other wetlands for for the water birds, because I, I don't think you know if, if you put all your strength to fight with the government you can win that, but if you can propose with the compensation side, mm -hmm. so you still we can save size for for water birds. Um, Arnie, I think uh, you can better explain how the water birds can be saved um, if ever the uh, airport is going to be built in Bulacan. I, I shall try to do my best based on my 30 years experience living in the Philippines and working in the Philippines everywhere with a focus on uh, wetlands uh, and working for Wetlands International and having my soft spots on, on, on the water birds. I do not know if wetlands and water birds in the Philippines can be saved. It can perhaps be saved because the Philippines is a huge country. And even, even that the evil part of the government, I call it evil because there is a huge, huge discrepancy between what the government promotes, for example, the last two uh, international meetings under the Ramsar Convention, for example, the, the, the conference of the signatory parties and also for the Convention on Migratory Species. This is just two relevant conventions that the Philippines is very active in. The government proposed especially to protect coastal wetlands and got these proposals adopted by the parties. I think there are about 170 <laughs> countries that are members of, of the Ramsar Convention. And even so, if you judge on the deeds of what the same government is doing, there's a huge discrepancy. So there's a kind of a schizophrenic approach between that part of the, of the Ministry of Environment that is supposed to protect and those who uh, approve business permits. The, the whole, I think, I think I was mentioning it. The, the, the whole thinking of, wet, of wetlands is something that has to be used and converts into money. And especially when it comes to reclamation, including airports, these gigantic profit numbers totally, totally uh, 
eradicates any thoughts about international or even national protection. And that makes it, that makes it very difficult also, for example, for the Bird Club and, and other NGOs, uh, even recently where we will huge difficulties had the options to file positions on the of, of, of permits approved in this case for example the airport where the documents used for the approval was so, so <coughs> full of errors but the dnr continues to issue the permits so i would say in short unless the philippines gets gets a specific law protecting wetlands, both the freshwater ones and the, the, along the coast. I am, I am very, very pessimistic. Why am I pessimistic? Because if we, we analyze what we have gathered of data that I think I accidentally presented here, but because of time couldn't present everything, you will see, for example, just in our lifetime, 99% of all the mangroves has been converted into business, in this case, fish ponds. And the fish ponds has been eating out in the bay, taking away the mudflats. The mudflats in 40 years has gone down from 5,000 hectares. And now with the airport approval, it will be go below 1,000 hectares, probably to 900 hectares. And as thing I mentioned, just since we published uh, the wetland, the results of all this, which you can, it would be very good thing, Guy, if you could find, yes. maybe I can find the uh, the link to, um. the link uh, in internet to the Manila Bay Habitats and Waterbird uh, report that I put together. You will, you will see that everything just goes down, down, down. In my 30 years here, I have not, I have not, collaborated with an air, with a government that in in real action when it comes to wetlands has been so destructive as this one so we can only pray uh, that by 2000 and what would that be 2022 with the new administration coming in that there may may be a shift but it will not come without a specific law that protects the Philippine wetlands. The Philippines doesn't have such a law, and therefore it is kind of a free take to uh, just demolish and put business interests and other things, uh, which is counterproductive to uh, to anything that has with wetlands to do. And uh, uh, that <coughs> is what I would say in the first round of this. So I'm. I'm, I'm I used to be very optimistic and I have had great, great happiness to work with this huge team of, of volunteers. And of course we work with the bird club that I'm part of, but uh, with the current administration, I think there's no hope. Oh, well, the second thing I would say, maybe this monster COVID pandemic is providing perhaps a little end of the tunnel. I have no idea that it will be possible to serve millions of passengers in the new airport if, if we take that because there seems to be an over optimistic uh, understanding of what do you do when you have a worldwide uh, virus moving around this is not going to go away this year next year and so forth so the whole idea that we will see flights and travel and tourism as we saw before uh, I think is not going to be the case. So ultimately, I think the guys investing in the airport will run into economic problems half the way through their investment. At least we can hope that. <laughs> Strong present. Sorry? Yeah. I mean, you said this is all, you know, pessimistic, it's pretty sad. But there is only one way, and that is why the Bird Club and, and people like Miss Tingai, starting as a scary volunteer to be a very good bullfighter for our water birds, there's only one way to continue, and that is to fight on and, uh, and share and, and persuade the decision makers to understand 
that as thing I said, what is good for birds is good for people. It's not just the birds. Where the birds are, the environment is good. And with this comes, of course, um, another little challenge that the Philippines has, namely there's an uncontrolled population development. Uh, if there were less people, there would be less problem. Uh, we are going now towards, I don't know, 140, 120 million people and an increase in the population around Manila Bay of people that will double the next 20, 30 times, 30 years. And I have never heard anyone in the government, NGOs, donors, that wants really to address the main problem. There are simply too many people in the world. Okay, thank you, Arnie. Uh, before we're going to more discussion, uh, let's take a group photo first, okay? Okay. Yeah, so uh, please everyone turn on your camera. Tubes, Emily. Okay, Gumbo. Chubs. Hello, everybody. Hello. Chiki. Hi. Gumbo, you're still with us? Well, anyway, let's take a group photo now. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Just in time, Gumbo. Oh, okay. All right, all right. And that's it. <laughs> Basically, I'm driving, so... <laughs> all right, all right. Safe driving. Well, take it easy. Oh, it's all right, it's all right. Okay. Now... Whoop. Andrew? No? All right. One, two, three. Okay, thank you, everybody. So let's go on discussion. Uh, are there more questions to Kingai or Arnie? Uh, Christina, Mark here. Yeah, hi, uh, Mark. Uh, you, you mentioned in your survey that there was a decrease in the number of birds being counted. How about the number of species? Are they still stable or coming down? Um, Species-wise, I believe that um, we have an increasing number, especially of the threatened ones. Um, uh, we have cited um, some species this year that we haven't found like in the past five years, particularly the Nordman's, um, Nordman's Greenshank. And we saw also, uh, well, three Dunlins this year. Um, what we didn't see in the Bulacan area was the black-faced spoonbill. But they saw this in the Tansa area in Navotas, which is like a couple of kilometers only away from the original site. I hope I was able to answer your question, Mark. Well, it was a little bit more encouraging that way than all bad news uh, so far. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes. The, may I add? Yes, please, Arne. It is not really going to be normally in our lifetime, you will lose a species. So, uh, so as I think I suggested, we have not lost species to our knowledge um, in our active years, but yes and no. Uh, if you go back historical, a hundred years ago, uh, this famous Philippine pelican was really, were, were were regularly uh, in, for example, the northern part of Manila Bay. And Philippine pelican is uh, extinct in the Philippines, despite the name. And we can also see in the historical records other species. For example, the black faced spoon, many of the historical records of black faced spoonbills were very regularly 100 years ago. But where we can measure in our lifetime, for certain species population is a we can confirm that the negative decline along the flyway which is also caused also caused by massive uh, reclamation uh, in china for example and in south korea that we can see similar trends for about of 18 species that we know of with our data from the flyway we can see at least 11 of these guys, these species are also declining in, uh, in Manila Bay. 
But overall, we <clears throat> only go out in January. So the more we go out and the more months we cover, the more knowledge we will have. For example, we have no clue of idea of how many birds are there in Manila Bay. Uh, Manila Bay is a gigantic area. We know along the coastline that there is a minimum of 200,000. But when we go further inland, we have no idea. And we do not know how big are the numbers actually in, actually in these days of what we call the transmigrato transmigratory populations coming from, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia passing through the Philippines. We have indications. Let me just mention that uh, two years ago when I was out in Pampanga River, by a great, great surprise, we, we estimated about 11,000 marsh sandpipers, which is an ab abnormal number of, of, of birds because we maximum normally would have 4,000. But that is an, a suggestion of what what can Manila Bay support? So no, no, in our lifetime, no loss of species, but we see more and more, uh, more and more species going the wrong way in the red data lists, going from near threatened to uh, vulnerable to endangered to critical endangered. Uh, for example, like the uh, like the Northman Green change which I actually saw the first time I was in uh, Talib TV. Um, so all indications go the wrong way, unfortunately. Um, I can, huh? all right. can I ask something to the entire group? Yeah, yes, hi. please. Yeah. Hey, hello, Christina. Thank you very much. Hi, <laughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you, Raj. Yeah. Your beautiful places. Here, I would like to ask um, you or anybody in the group that uh, does any of us are expert into the bird strikes? Does any of us has done, a, you know, any sort of a study or presentation to the airports, you know, the bird strikes? because the, one of our um, airlines, you know, they are offering us, you know, there's not offering, sorry, requesting us to give, a, you know, the bird strikes, the talk about this, uh, since we don't know anything about this, because around November, it was a time of our, you know, the, the mostly raptor migration. So one of the helicopter, you know, got hit by the, they call it eagle or vulture, and I suppose must be the steppy eagles hit by or oh. something. We didn't find any any birds, but the helicopter got shut down. I mean, safely landed. You know the little um, fractures or broken things, but the helicopter, all the passengers were bored and were safely rescued. Yeah, so they are requesting us to give a talk. So does any of you know about the bird strikes? You know what think, sort of things uh, we could, uh, you know, the deliver to them. Do you know any any of? Well, um, bird strikes are a sensitive um, topic, and I think Arne is uh, the person to do that um, because he has done uh, work for the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines, determining you know where the birds go come from. I mean the directions they fly to. And he has been an expert consultant um, in building airports, Arne? Well, <clears throat> yeah, that is correct that I, I, I uh, before COVID advised Philippine Airlines, uh, uh, what is this, uh, Air Asia, and the third one, Cebu Pacific, as a bird strike advisor. And therefore I've been traveling around in the Philippines and visited a lot of airports. Um, before that, I also worked in Scandinavia's largest airport as a bird strike specialist. Um, having said so, in the context of the Phil <laughs> Philippines and the new airport, bird strikes was not considered. So uh, good luck. Uh, and it is, it is very sad, but it indicates, as I said, 
maybe I was too candid, that I have not much hope with this current uh, administration because they're not listening to science, they're not listening. They take their political economic decisions and then the rest follows. There's no doubt in my mind, uh, two things. One, it is difficult to have a bird strike. You have to have a lot of bird flight operations before you statistically get a strike. And most strikes doesn't really uh, produce uh, that big scale of problems that really would raise the attention, namely that you have a full blown strike and you have an airplane that crash and people die. And we know unfortunately from other countries that this kind of events that gets the polit politicians to wake up. So the Philippines, and I, I guess it's the same in most countries, still builds airports where they shouldn't be. And the Manila Bay Airport shouldn't be where it is. Just like the new airport in Thailand, in Bangkok, or the relatively new one, is built in a wetland and everybody was been in the new airport, especially the bird watchers are very happy because when you're waiting to fly, you can see all these huge birds, cormorants, uh, what is this, open bill storks, and all kind of big bird species that normally are classified as top top problems and where you therefore either try to mitigate uh, avoid it but you cannot shoot you cannot kill the threatened species that's normally not allowed so somehow the airport authorities is struggling to figure out what to do i looked into the capacity of airport staff what equipment do they have how well have they been trained do they understand the, as we as bird watchers do, do they understand the movements of birds? Do they, can they think as a bird? Why are they going there to eat? Why are they sleeping there? Voila, that doesn't exist. So, so you are raising a very important problem. And if we look statistically on the number of birds in that part of Manila Bay, uh, that thing guy was, was excellently presenting, you can see if we roughly say in that airport area, which will cover about 2000 hectares, but the adjacent areas have many more birds. That is roughly 50,000 birds that we know of, at least in January. Plus every morning there are thousands of fish eating species like the whiskered terns and eaglets flying in and out to feed. Uh, and if you compare that with the airport, you know, if you have been to the Philippines, the existing Manila airport, Naia airport, uh, Naia Airport is neighbor to about 1,500 water birds. So if you take if you take 1,500 water birds and 50,000 water birds, and you uh, have a projection of thousands of percentage increase in flights, automatically there will be there will be many 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 more bird strikes. Um, but so far. So far, I do not know what the proponent is supposed to do to it. There is no overall expertise in existing airports really to mitigate the way you probably do in the huge international airports like Heathrow or John F. Kennedy Airport or maybe also in Bangkok. Um, so also from that perspective, it's, it's, a very, it's a very silly decision to put it where it is, where, the, where it's going to be. I, I don't know if, if it is very okay. uh, no no thank you thank you Ernie. thank you christine christina yeah yeah i know thank you. very serious serious questions yeah serious problem too we had a major two problems um you know the bird strike is one thing by this civil aviation and second one is the electrification is another problem we got Recently, big birds like uh, you know the the Sarah screens and the vultures been electrocuted. That's also. Are you working? Way. May I ask? Are you working with an airline company? No, I don't. Okay. But I have friends who owns the, you know, some uh, the, the 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 company, to, you know, dom domestic airlines, like a chopper and then other airplanes. Yeah, that's what they were asking me. What country is that? If I may ask. So uh, from Nepal. Nepal. Okay. Have you been here? Vultures. 
<laughs> Sorry. You must also have a lot of vultures. The Nepali Nepali culture before was very happy to have to feed vultures, even the dead bodies. I remember. Yeah, it's still some part, some northern part. We do have um, that sort of cultures, and now we are feeding in our restaurants. You know the vulture restaurants. We Perfect. have a seven. Yeah, we have a seven vulture restaurants in Nepal that we are feeding. Yeah, feeding also breeding and all sort of things we are doing. All right, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Tingai, for the great presentation. We learned a lot yeah. from you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> before we go, before we say goodbye, so uh, Mike, hello, Mike. Where are we going next week? Who is our oh, speaker? next? Yeah. The next week, our speaker is here with us tonight, Mr. Marty Hi. Sean. Yes. Oh. Hello, Marty. Hi, Marty. Marty of Samhyasna. Uh, he will talk us about Hello. tell us about conservation challenges in Cambodia during the COVID season. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. So hope you join us again tomorrow, uh, Friday evening next week. Yep. All right. Thank yep. you again, Tingai and okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm gonna miss the next week uh, presentation as I'll be in the mountains. I'm going to first do it, so... Don't worry, don't worry. I'll send you the link, you know. I'm going to... I can, I can watch. just subscribe yeah. ABF YouTube channel and you will see all oh, the... Oh, yes. Stuff. Don't yeah, worry about it. I have, yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, everybody. And... Yeah. Thank have you. a nice weekend. Bye. Have a nice weekend, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for a nice Bye. presentation, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.